Scripture reading is coming from two texts, first being that of Genesis chapter 3 and verse 7, and the second being that of Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. Again, that's Genesis chapter 3, verse 7, followed up by Revelation chapter 12, verse 17. And I'll read in your hearing. <coughs> and the eyes of them both were opened. All right. And they knew that they were naked. Uh -huh. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Right. Revelation 12, 17 reads such. And the dragon was wroth with the woman right. and went to make war with the remnant of her seed, mm -hmm. which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Amen. May the Lord add a blessing to the reading and hearing and the doers of his word. Amen. Amen. You may you be seated. seated. Thank you. 
you don't realize, if you don't take nothing from this morning, you should at least take this. All is well. God doesn't know. He doesn't care where you are in life right now. He doesn't care about those things that seems to be burials in your life right now because all is well. We're talking about the King of Kings and Lords of Lords. He set the earth in motion. So how much more, how much more can you expect out of your life? When God says, all is well, all is well. Thank you, Lord. I can just ride on, on that notion alone. Thank you, Lord. <laughs> all is well. I know you brought your Bibles this morning. I know you brought your sword this morning. And we're going to turn there in a minute. We're going to turn in our Bibles to Genesis 3, 7. I have two scriptures. Genesis 3, 7 and Revelations 12, 17. And we're going to put a bookmark in both of those scriptures. because We're going to stay right there for a moment. So right now, let's come before the Lord in prayer. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes with me as I pray? All is well. Lord, my God, I have accepted a job I cannot do, and yet I'm here. Lord, you know, and I know, that I've never done anything successful without you. In fact, anytime anybody thought I've done anything good, it wasn't me. It was always you. So, Lord, right now, I come humbly asking that you fill up what sounds like my voice with the power of your voice. Empty me, Father, and fill me up with your presence. I promise you, I'll say what you want me to say. And if I planned it, I'll say it. But if I never planned it, I'll say it anywhere. Because this is your day, Lord. This is your house. We are your people, and we have come to hear your voice. Speak to us, Father. In the mighty name of Jesus, let the church say, Amen. Amen. In Genesis 3, 7, it reads, And the eyes of them both were opened, and they knew they were naked, and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves, what everybody? Aprons. As soon as sin began here on earth, after Eve had eaten the forbidden fruit, legalism began. Legalism. You know what legalism is. The strict and sometimes more excessive traditions to the law a religious or a moral code that restrict us, God's people, from free choice. Legalism, for instance, what we dare not to do, what we will not to do on the Sabbath, huh? Legalism, okay? Follow me. What we don't eat, what we won't eat, to the point we miss out on the blessings of God, the blessings that he desires to have in good health. So soon after legalism, soon after Eve was deceived by the serpent, Adam made the choice to follow his wife and not God's instructions to eat from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. You know the story of man's fall, right? Adam realized his wife was without coverings, him alike. In the text it says, 
and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves aprons. Here, Adam tries to cover his shame by his own works. How many of us know a little something about that? Cover our own shame in our own works. He attempts to do what many of us today do. We lie and we try to cover it up with another lie. Yeah. Or we take something that doesn't belong to us and we justify it by believing we are more, much more deserving of it. Yes, I can do better with this. Yes, I can make better use of this legalism. So like Adam, we begin to sow fig leaves together and place them upon our flesh. However, covering with fig leaves doesn't work when you're trying to cover up a mess from God. It might be deceiving to you and me. It might be deceiving to the human eye, but with God, nothing is missed. So being ashamed of his nakedness, Adam ran from God. How many of you are running from God right now? Illustrations. Kids make a good illustration. Remember back when you were a kid and you play a game of hide and seek. Okay, and playing a game of hide and seek, you have to go and find the perfect hiding spot. Sometimes under the bed, in the closet, behind the couch, under a chair, but sometimes you find a spot and it don't quite work for you. But being young, you really don't know. You think you are in invisible. So let me tell you an illustration about my, my daughter. When my former husband, Christopher, God rest his soul, he would come home every day from work, day after day. Kennedy, our daughter, would hide from him. It was a, a ritual. It would, it would happen almost every single day as if it was a new thing for the both of them. He would come through the door, walk down the hall into our bedroom. He would come with his hand raised up and he would make an entry. He would knock on the door and he would unlock the door just so Kennedy could get a signal. She must have been two, three years old. And he would come through the door and he would say, honey, I'm home. And that would be her signal to find her hiding spot. He would walk down the hallway with this monstrous hands raised up in the air and he would go and look for Kennedy in those places we used to find ourselves, in those places like under the couch, under the bed, and sometimes behind a chair or wherever. But Kennedy, every day like clockwork, she would go to our bedroom and she would stand in the middle of the bed. She would stand in the middle of the bed to hide from her dad. She would take the cover and cover her head and stand two feet tall, maybe two or three feet tall, but she would stand right there in the middle of the bed. And I would just stand and look because it would happen almost every day, the same hiding place. Christopher would come in and Kennedy would be standing there thinking she was invisible. Sometimes we find ourselves doing just that as adults. We try to hide from God in places that are no mystery to God. We try to pretend we are invisible. And with God's eyes, nothing is invisible. I don't care how far you run. I don't care how many fig leaves you try to place on your skin. Nothing is invisible to God. So like Adam, we try to run from God, and we put on our fig leaves. Hmm. Why did Adam feel naked after making such a garment of fig leaves, literally covering his physical, yet all the while still feeling ashamed and naked? You know, some of you, most of you have gone through college, right? 
So therefore, you've gone through uh, your primary grades, your elementary grades, your middle and your high school. You know how it's like when a child goes into a classroom, middle of the year, or even at the beginning of the year. You have to go in, and sometimes the teacher stand, puts you out in front and, and introduce who you are. You're a first-time student. But for some reason, you do this year after year, maybe a couple of times in your lifetime you've been put in front of a classroom, and then yet, out of all those times, each one of them, you feel like every eye is on you. And you feel for some reason as if they're staring at you when you're naked. You know the feeling. You walk into your job for the very first time or on a new job, and you feel like everybody is staring at you. Well, like God, in the presence of his glory, we are physically and spiritually naked. We try. We really do. We try to dress up our affairs knowing we are spiritually naked. But when our backs are against the wall, when our backs are down to the floor and we have only one way to look up, then, only then, enough is enough. And the hiding place is no longer conceal us from God's sight. We then submit and surrender all to God. God then, God then can begin the reconstruction that is needed. So later on, I told you to put a bookmark in your Bible. Because we're going to stay here just for a minute at Genesis 3, 7. But a few lines below verses 7 in verse 21, this is where God is starting the reconstruction of Adam. Follow down with me to verse 21. Verse 21 of chapter 3 in Genesis. It reads, Unto Adam... Also, and to his wife, did the Lord God make coats of skin and clothe them. He made coats of skin to clothe them. Well, of course, I had to ask myself this question. I had to ask myself, what difference in who clothed Adam? He had already put on his fig leaves. So... Why in the world did God need to follow behind that and put on coats of skin? So realizing the answer doesn't distinguish who clothed Adam, rather what was clothed or what God used to clothe him with. You see, the International Reader's Version, it reads, the Lord God made clothes out of animal skin for Adam and his wife to wear. Notice in this version, it reads a little different from your King James version. Instead of coats of skin, the international reader says in animal skin. The spirit led me to a more further research of what type of animal skin it really was. And this is where it gets really good. Because sometimes we go around with our decorative, you know, the real fine linen, uh, fig leaves, you know, we cover up those lies so good, it's hard to believe in it for ourselves. So here, God had to use animal skin. I discovered that God didn't make just any old skin for Adam. In fact, it wasn't just any animal skin. God clothed animal Adam in sheep skin. Not in wool, you see, not in polyester, not in leather, or what we sometimes wear, pleather, or any other type of skin, not even in silk. Although these things can be fashionable to the human eye, God needed to clothe Adam in a spiritual cloth. Follow me now, showing him that in his nakedness, he needed to be covered with the Lamb of God. The sheepskin in this verse represents the Lamb of God. Only the death of the Lamb, the slain Lamb of God, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ, can cover us in our spiritual nakedness, which leads me to my title of my sermon. Take off your fig leaves. 
put on his image. Take off your fig leaves and put on his image. Turn to the person next to you and tell them, take off your fig leaves. Put on his image. The image, this image, this, this image that comes from the coverings of Jesus Christ. You, you know what, people? You can't even get any better than that. You can't find a more finer cloth than the cloth of Jesus Christ. You can't run to Nemus Marcus and buy a more price-worthy cloth that covers you in your nakedness, that can cleanse the filthiest. Do you hear me? That can take an old wrench like myself and you and spring forth life. Not just that dirty old raggedy life, but spring forth the true life that can always Always, not just sometimes, not just a little, but can always wash away your sin, all of your sin that could bring that could bring a liar, that can bring a liar to be a what? A testifier, that can bring a Saul, a murderer, and make him a messenger. That can, that, take off your fig leaves right now. If you don't feel like it, just do it just because. Take it off, because with the image of God, nothing, nothing can go unclean. Jesus Christ took the tax collector, a tax collector, and he covered him, and he made him a giver, a Joseph, a humble houseboy. And he made him a prince of Egypt. And Obama, an African American like you and myself, to be the president of the United States for the second term, people. Take off your fig leaves and put on his image, God's image, the sheepskin covering of Jesus Christ. Let's talk about this, this covering for a minute, okay? When God has covered you, you feel so good despite where you are in your life homeless jobless alone heartbroken even in your lack of nothing can touch you when you have on his image you know the um the gum uh, double mint Okay, you remember the commercial that used to come on? Uh, you pop a double mint stick of gum in your mouth, and there behold, you hear, you see another person that looks identical to that person. Cute, right? Cute, yeah, right? Everybody then wanted to have a twin, a double mint twin, right? Even if you didn't have a twin, your friend, cousin, relative, you guys walk down the street like you almost was a twin. You would wear the same t-shirt. You would wear the same jeans. You would go so far as wearing the same shoe because you wanted to be a double mint twin. The advertisement that you can be a better person if you buy a stick of gum, chew it, you can feel real good. The image that double mint gum has on us is big time. But I'm not talking about the double mint twins. The Bible speaks of a people that reflect the image of God. A type of people who resembles God's likeness. A people who conduct themselves in a godly manner. A people whose language is as gentle as God's, even under uncompromising situation. You know when your friends get you all rattled up and you get so angry well, see, when God covers you and you're in his image, those things no longer bother you. When your boss come to your cubic and, and you're so fed up with all the paperwork and you're tired and the hours are long, well, see, with God's image on you, those things no longer bother you. These people, when tested, can stand on their faith doing hardship. Eva, you know something about that. You stand on your faith even when you're without. A people that exists even in today's world. However, the Bible doesn't say, Kita, that your life will be stress-free. 
In fact, the Bible says that these people will suffer persecution. These people will undergo trials and tribulations while suffering. But yet, while suffering, they will keep in mind the faithful and know that there is a blessed hope to all those who not only love him, but keep in faith. Now, why would God suffer his people, the people who was walking in his obedience? Why would God then allow them to go through trials and tribulations? Let's turn to our Bibles to Revelations 12, 17. Revelations 12, 17. In Revelations chapter 12, verses 17, the Bible says, and the dragon was happy. The dragon was extremely glad. He was just dancing in his shoes. That's not what it says. It says that the dragon was wroth. He was extremely angry with the woman and went to make war with the remnant of her seed which keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who, everybody? Of Jesus Christ. This woman loved God so much that despite her circumstances, despite where she was, despite her lack, she loved God so much she kept his commandments. Now, this particular type of woman not only has to be clothed in the sheepskin of Jesus Christ, but she has to have the image of God. The characteristics of this woman are a true resemblance of God's character. And the dragon, again, was made, was wroth. He was wroth with the woman with the woman, with the woman. Let's establish clarity here, okay? Who is this woman? Who is this woman? The woman symbolizes the church, God's house, his people. In both the Old and the New Testament, God represents his people with a woman. As the bridegroom, he is married to the church. Paul wrote, in, wrote to the Corinthians in 2 Corinthians 11.2. He writes that, I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. All through the Bible, we can follow the records of the same symbolism. The woman as the church. Now follow me to the Old Testament. That was the New Testament. The Old Testament in Jeremiah, and if you, don't, if you can't uh, thumb through the Bible as fast as I'm talking, you can write these scriptures down, okay? It's in Jeremiah 6-2 where it says, I have likened the daughter of Zion to a comely and delicate woman. Here, the church is called Zion. And God compares this with the beautiful woman. In the Old Testament, Israel was the chosen people of so often portrayed as being married to God. And in the New Testament, the true Israel, God is no longer a nation. I'm sorry, the true Israel of God is no longer a nation. It's no longer a country. It's no longer the United States of America. It's not Iraq. It's not a far off. But it is a church composed of you, you, and me. It's composed of Jews and of Gentiles who all receive Christ as their Savior. You see, it doesn't end there. It gets really interesting. The text in Revelations 12, 17, 
does not only identifies a people, it identifies a specific people. The word remnant, I love this. The word remnant identifies not just any church or its seed. You can't just go to any church and be expected to be part of the remnant. The church, this church, are the people keep all the commandments of God. Now that's nothing new to us. All of us keep all the commandments of God, right? At least we hope. Not just, and I'm not just talking about thou shall not steal, kill, or bear false witness. Not just the ones that interfere in our life when law comes in, when the law of the land comes in. You know, when we do something or break something or commit a crime against the law of the land, there's usually consequences, and more than likely, there's jail time. So we don't want to mess with those commandments that interfere with the law of the land. But this people, this, this type of people, are not worried about that. They keep all the commandments of God, even those that there's no immediate consequence or reaction. Now, some of us might think that, um, you know, when you go to sleep and you have these dreams, I used to have them when I was a kid. You know, I had this magic power. I can make things stop. I can make things freeze in my dream. And some of you might want that same magic power even in reality. If you could, you probably would try to get away with some of the things that you have in your mind to get away with. You might want that special big time car. You got that magic power. You know you can't, you know, you're not, you're not going to be found out, so you'll go and do it. But see, these people, this church, they're not worried about all of that. They keep all of God's commandments, even if, even if no one else acknowledges they keep the seventh day Sabbath holy. This people honor their father and their mothers. In today's world, sometimes even in our own homes, our children, our children think that the word why should be behind every command of their parents. In the classroom, it's worse than that. They don't even have to look at you in your face. They'll walk away before they say anything. But the whole thing is, these people raise their children up to honor their father and their mother. Henceforth, when you get old enough and know better, you've already learned to honor your father, your earthly father. Then you begin to grow and you begin to honor your heavenly father in the things that you say. In the things that you do, you begin to honor your father, your heavenly father. This type of people, let me continue, their faith changes not under circumstances. Lights get cut off. You even have family members that seem to go south on you. And then you, you, you have something that is uncontrollable, death. Well, these people and their circumstances do not define them. Better yet, they know that their circumstances don't define who God is in their lives. This type of people adhere to God's law, not just the New Testament, but refers to the Testaments of old and new. God spoke all of these words, not me. The law of the Ten Commandments, which is found in Exodus 20, verses 1 through 17. This is the law of God's making. These words are ordered by the infinite, eternal majesty of heaven and earth and were the spoken words of the king of kings and lords of lords, which is surely not just holy, but it's powerful. And that's why we ought to carefully follow them more earnestly. So what this is, is a seed that truly reflect the image of God, which is covered by Jesus' character. So now we understand the significance of the word remnant. The word remnant set things apart. In this case, it sets apart a people. Let's briefly cover the correct meaning of remnant and its origin. The word 
originates from the Hebrew. Hebrew. And it comes from three Hebrew words. First, simple, palat. You can say it, palat. This word means those who escape, or simply escape. It refers to the word remnant. For example, the Bible gives us reference to a people who had to escape from bondage. Turn with me to the book of Romans, Romans 11, where Paul asks a question. Have God cast away his people? The question is answered by a direct denial. God forbids. Let's read verses 1 through 5. Romans 11, verses 1 through 5. Follow me as I read the English Standard Version. Hmm. It always seems a little bit more clearer to my understanding when I read from the English Standard Version. Okay? Here it reads, I am, I ask then, has God rejected his people? By no means. For I myself am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham, a member of the tribe of Benjamin. God has not rejected his people whom he foreknew. Do you know what the scripture says of Elijah? How he appears to God against Israel. The Lord has killed your prophets. They have demolished your altars, and alone I am left, and they seek my life. But what is God's reply to him? I have kept for myself, hallelujah, I have kept for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal. And in verse 5 it says, so too, a present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. So here, you have a people who, is, who keep the commandment of God. Thou shall not have any other gods before me. God has allowed not one, but 7,000 men to escape the wrath of the earthly king, King Ahab. The last always seem to be the best even in this scripture, God's appeared, God appears to be blessed by those individuals who have kept his commandments. He finds it as a delight. He doesn't find that your struggling is a delight, but he sees that you have been willing to make a sacrifice even unto death to follow him all the way. I remember playing tag when I was younger. And I was the fastest of the bunch. I always was the fastest of the bunch. I, I, I ran and ran and ran. But in the first few seconds after the it person would count from 1 to 10 or 1 to 20, I would be the first one on the base. First one. And I would just stand there because, you know, the prize is you get there on the base, so you're not going to be it. You're not going to get tagged. So I used to always try to be the first one to the base. But see, like God, the last is always saved, and it's always the best. I used to stand there mad because at least for five to ten minutes, the last person, the slowest person, used to always have the fun because the it person used to always run and run and run to chase after the last person. And I used to stand there because I used to say, I'm the first person to the base. Shouldn't I have the most fun? But it seems like the last person, the slowest person was always having the fun. He or she was always being chased. The last is sometimes the best of it all, right? God always saves the best for last. Now, the second and third Hebrew words pretty much means the same. The second word is shirah. Can you say that? Shirah. Meaning the rest, what remains. The word also defines the word remnant. And the third Hebrew word is yatha. Yatha, can you say that? Yatha. Which means what remains. 
the, remind, the remainder or the remnant. Let's read Joel 2, verse 32. Joel 2, verse 32. Turn with me. And I'm going to, again, read from the um, English Standard Version. Joel 2, 32. And it reads, And it shall come to pass that everyone who, who calls on the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape, or in your Bible, deliverance. As the Lord has said, and among the survivors or remnant shall be those whom the Lord calls. So even in today's life, surrounding the great tribulation, as it reads in 1217, the remnant of her seed is defined also in Joel 2, 32. And again, the seed is not just any type of seed or people. This people walk in the obedience to God. This people have taken off their fig leaves and put on the image of God. Now earlier, I talked about the imagery, how it could be cute, the double mint twins and everything. But it also can be important to us. Going to work, we always want to look our best. We want to look professional, right? When we're in front of our friends, image is everything. We want to roll in with our spouse on the side, looking good. We want to wear the tightest shoe. You know what I'm talking about, Kevon. You want to even look good with your fade up haircut. Image is important. It's everything. The concept of looking good isn't a bad idea. We like to look our best. So I understand we like to look good. And some reason or another, we, you know what I'm talking about, no offense to anybody else, we like to look good as a people. In fact, we put on our Sabbath best and we look good. A matter of fact, my niece, my niece Jessica, I got to throw this in, my niece Jessica, she's over at my house all the time. And I had promised her and Kennedy that I was going to take them with me to the grocery store. We got up real early, 7, 8 o'clock in the morning, and I started getting ready. Well, my getting ready was different from her getting ready. She followed me into the closet where I picked out what I'm going to wear. She followed me, and this is Jessica. Kennedy already knows, so she sit back and read a book. Jessica... She follows me into the bathroom, and you know, us ladies, we got to put on our face. We got to look, you know, decent. I've gotten a little better because I, I used to have to do this even when I go to the trash can and put my trash up. But now we're going to the grocery store, and I say, you know, let me put on my face and do my hair. And Jessica is just standing, waiting patiently on her auntie. So she looks at me, and I put on my shoes, and I always got on heels, guys. If it's not stilettos, there's boots. And they always have to have a heel because I'm actually only 5'4". So I'm a little old shunt runt. So I got to put on my heels, and Jessica's looking at me, and I don't go put on any jeans or even crisp jeans. I go and put on my nice skirt. So Jessica looks at me. She said, Auntie. Every time we go somewhere, no matter where we're going, we're going to the grocery store. Why you got to always look like you're going to church? <laughs> so we'd like to, friends, I like to look good. I like to look my best. Even my best friend, one of my best friend, Carol, she always look at me. She goes, Christina, I should have known. You always look good, even when we get ready to go to the zoo. Yes, people. It's a ritual that's passed down from generation to generation. Look your best. There's no shame in it though. Even our pastors on Sabbath morning come out in their preacher's suits. They got to look good. There's nothing wrong with that. Am I right or am I wrong? They got to look good. Okay, so let me tell you a story about a preacher's and his, a preacher and his uh, preacher's suit, a pastor and his preacher's suit. And this is a true story by the way. This pastor was fresh out of seminary school. 
and was excited about being a first-time pastor like he should be, spiritually wi um, wired. He was ready to spread his wings after leaving the nest. This pastor was ready and had proven to be a very distinguished pastor of all times. And I'm not going to tell you who this is. But on a first-year pastor's salary, he could only afford a first-year salary wardrobe. So you think. So you think he would only afford what he could, what his house could stretch for, but not him. This pastor desired a more tasteful wardrobe. He wanted to look good. He wanted to be his best. And there's nothing wrong with being your best, even if it's a tie, shoe, or for most of us ladies, bags. There's nothing wrong with that. If God blessed you, then receive it. But this pastor, he would travel to the nearest shopping mall and he would browse the stores to find himself a suit that stood out from the rest. He didn't want the typical suit. He didn't even want to look like the pastor down the street. He did not even want to look like anyone you can identify. He wanted to stand out from the rest. He wanted to look good. I mean, today I couldn't find the best suit, but I, I wanted to look good. I wanted to be presented well put together, not just conduct myself, but I wanted to look good, and there's nothing wrong with that. He walks into a store that appears to feed his appetite in suits. He began to pick out several different kinds of suit, and he started trying them on. So he really, really, after, especially after he tried them on, he wanted them all. He desired them all. But he took a glance at the price tag. Mm. He knew that he could not afford, not all of them, not even one of them. The pastor had to make a decision. He decided to ask the attendant about the garments he had selected, thinking that he could somehow narrow down his search. Maybe this guy's going to tell me something a little bit better about this suit or, or another place I can go to to get one just like what I have. The attendant looked at the pastor, and he could tell that this pastor had an expensive taste by looking at the suits he had picked out. But knew by looking at the pastor and what he was driving and his appearance, he could also tell the pastor would not be able to afford the suits without going broke. The, the salesperson explained the value of each suit, telling the pastor that each suit was hand sewed to be custom fit, made and had been imported from afar. These suits carry value not because of how they look or feel on the skin, but because the cost of making the garment telling the pastor that didn't discourage the pastor from wanting to purchase all of them, not just one, but he then really wanted, he just had to have the suits. His interest, in fact, his interest even grew. He knew if he wore the suits, he would actually stand out from the rest. So the pastor, even more determined to purchase the suits, he thought by purchasing one at a time that he would sooner or later have them all. Every pay period, it never failed, every pay period, the pastor walked into the store and out with a new suit. While the salesperson looked on and knowing that the, the young pastor looked disturbing, every week coming in buying a new suit but going broke. Some of us do that. We take big leaps. When God tells us only take a small step, we go and we, and, and it's not that we don't trust God, but sometimes God's voice we don't hear and we reject or neglect to see his perfect plans for us. So this pastor, month after month, the sale person, the salesperson looked on and he was so impressed because this pastor would come in every so once in a while and purchase a suit that was probably more than his whole check. But the salesperson looked 
And he was so impressed and so moved that this man was investing almost all of his savings and earnings in his clothing. So he would make, he thought he would make the, an offer to the young pastor that he couldn't refuse. On the next visit, the attendant would suggest a plan for the young pastor. The salesperson called over the pastor. He said, come here, my brother. I'm going to talk to you, and I'm going to give you some business, okay? So the salesperson invitingly told the young pastor that in a few weeks, just in a few weeks, he would own the very store he shopped in. And it would make, and he would make his shopping affordable even on a first year pastor's salary. So on the next visit, of course, the salesperson didn't greet the young pastor as an attendant. He greeted him as the owner. He then tells the pastor to pick out the most desirable suit that he could find in the store. And of course, the pastor did just that. He had a lot of practice in finding the perfect suit. Brother Price over there know a little something about picking a fine suit. This suit would cost more than any suits he had ever purchased. And you know his taste never came cheap. So indeed, the suit he picked out cost more than any of them in the store. While he brought the suit to the owner, the owner nodded with delight. And you know it, he nodded with delight because he knew that that suit was the bomb. He knew that the pastor picked out the exact suit that was suitable for a type of person. But the salesperson didn't go straight to the cash register. He didn't go straight to the cash register. He proceeded to the back of the store, waving his hands to the young pastor to follow him. Curious to where and why the owner was leading him to the back of the store. Sometime we got our hands, as people, we get our hands on a good deal, don't we? Sometimes we get our hands on really good deals. And then all of a sudden, things turn around. We almost got that job. We went for the third, not the first or second. We passed the first and second interview, and we got to sit down and be interviewed by the boss himself. But there was a turnaround, and they gave it to in-house. I just don't understand. So the, t the salesperson didn't go straight to the cash register. Plans was changed. The pastor simply followed as the owner came to a wall hanging rolls of fabric similar to what the pastor desired. The owner explained, he said, you know what? The wealthy people, they don't put their suits in the will call. For younger people, for, for you younger people, the will call is the layaways. That's what my dad used to always say. Don't put your clothes in the will call. The layaways. And they don't, he said, the attendant said, and they don't buy their clothes on credit. See, that's what um, the pastor was doing. He was pretty much buying his clothes on credit because he was paying for, for a suit with money he really didn't have. He was buying on credit, for real. They simply, the attendant said, afford their custom suits paying cash not because the rich not because they're rich and believe me he said they are rich but because they come to the back of the store the rich people don't pay a lot of money to wear the same suits you wear in fact they come to the back of the store and choose from the boats of fabric to custom make their suits and they make them for about one-fifth of what you buy your suit for. They don't buy according to the value, the money, but to the value of the suit. Although the pastor now was really puzzled, but he did realize that shopping in the back of the store with the most valuable fabric is much more cheaper than shopping in the front. And that didn't settle. Because he really wasn't, it didn't make any sense at first. So the owner, he takes and grabs a bolt of fabric. 
and explained to the young pastor that while this boat comes fully wrapped with its beautiful fabric all the way through to the boat, when the materials run low, what is left is the remnant of the fabric, the last of the last fabric on the boat. And that's why, he says, I can sell this to you for a little of nothing because it's the last of the last. Now let me tell you something, a little something about what I noticed about the remnant fabric. When the boat comes in, you guys have seen it, even, even if you've gone to Walmart, the boats of fabric that they have at Walmart's in the back where the arts and crafts are, I'm always there. But a boat of fabric comes in really big at first. It has fabric all the way through, beautiful fabric all the way through and all the way down. But listen to me, follow me now. The fabric, the last of the last, the remnant is so special being the last material of the last. Not just because it's the last, but because the last material is wrapped around the boat and has been wrapped so tight by the other material and every design, every emblem, and every imperfection is wrapped so tight that everything that is in the boat can be seen in the fabric. Because it's wrapped, you see, it's wrapped so tight to the boat. The remnant, the last, is wrapped so close to the boat that everything that is on the boat is in the fabric. Now, I'm standing here today, and I'm believing that Jesus is calling of such church, such a remnant to this church that is wrapped so close to him, wrapped so tight to him, that every feature of Jesus is represented in us. I'm excited about being the remnant. You should be excited about being the remnant. No matter what you go through, no matter what trial, what tribulation, even death, you're the remnant clothed in God's clothing. You've been specially touched by Jesus. You're different. You're set apart. You are particular and a peculiar people, a chosen and delivered people, a people that is clothed by the Savior's hand himself. But don't get it twisted, guys. Mm -mm. There's a difference between the regular folks and those who follow Jesus in the last days. Hint, knowing that the last days are tough times, and only the people that will stand during this time will be God's remnant. Those who not only keep one commandment are the ones that are fitting to them or convenient to them. This is a type of remnant that keeps all of God's commandment. And they know that there's a testimony in Jesus Christ. And by the way... <laughs> You can't tell them apart. You can't tell who they are just by looking around you. If you look to the person in back of you, if you look to the person, you could do this right now, look to the person to the left and to the right, in front of you, in back of you. Christians, and you're going to notice something, Christians and sinners alike appear to be the same. You can't just look at anybody and figure out if they're a Christian or a sinner. I don't care where you are, at the clubs, in the stores, even in the church. Hmm. Even in the church, you can't tell who they are. They all have the same smile. So if you ask the Christian slash sinner, are they saved, they'll smile at you. And they'll say, of course I'm saved. Sure, I'm saved. I'm not only saved, but I'm sanctified. They'll tell you those things. Yeah, they'll smile in your face and they'll say, I'm saved. I've been delivered from that years ago. I'm walking on the straight and narrow. I'm God's highly favor. If you ever walk up to somebody on the street, and yeah, it's been done. It's been done. You walk, on, walk up to somebody on the street and you ask them, 
Are you saved? It's been done. If you knew our late Michelle, you know that that can be true. Because Michelle would do just that. She would walk up to some of anybody. She would walk up to the most scariest. She had no fears. And see, that's the big thing. When you're wrapped in God's image, when he's touched you, there's no fear. There's no shame. And I believe Michelle knew our personal Savior. She was wrapped so tight. She had his image. She would walk up. One day, I was moving, and this girl came over, and she helped me move along with a couple of other friends. And we walked into a U-Haul store, okay? And we approached the um, counter where there, there was this um, blue-eyed guy, bald with red hair, a red beard, because he didn't have no hair on the top. You know, and he wasn't the type of person that I would have walked up to and started a conversation. Do you know what I mean? He wasn't of, our, of my origin. So, so Mich Michelle walked up to the counter, and she said, have you given your life to Jesus? And I don't think the guy has ever, ever been approached in that manner. And he said, no, I ain't giving my life to Jesus. I don't even know no Jesus. I'm an atheist. That didn't stop Michelle. Michelle didn't have any fears. And by the time she got done, even if the God didn't accept Jesus as his Lord and Savior, he knew of a special Savior, Jesus Christ. That's the image I'm talking about this morning. No shame and no fears. She would ask that question to anybody that God put her in front of. Are you a Christian? Not really knowing if they're truly a Christian. I mean, can you really tell if somebody's a Christian or a sinner? Everybody is doing fine. Everybody, when you ask them, oh, I'm highly favored, I'm blessed, and you, can't, you just can't tell them apart. Everybody has good jobs. Everybody drives a nice car. Everybody lives in a big home, wears nice clothing. You just can't tell a sinner from a Christian. Everybody smells the same way. But you wait. You wait till things get hard. You wait till times get hard. The Apostle Paul says, I know how to abound in God, and I also know how to abase. So whether or not I'm going through good times or bad times, I love the Lord. His image reveals all of that to us. I love Jesus 365 days in a year. And it's not because he's good to me. It's because his position in my life never changes. When there's good times and when there's bad times, I love the Lord. I love the Lord so much, I attempt to keep all his commandments. And I do it by the blood of Jesus. I do it in his strength. Because I not only want to honor my earthly father, I want to honor my heavenly father, in obedience. Amen? Amen? I discovered in a Christian's life, it's like pretty much like a roller coaster. You won't always be up. In fact, you ought to praise God while you're up because his blessings is what have you up there. But don't get it twisted. What comes up must go, must come must come down. And I've learned to love Jesus because he doesn't abandon me when I'm down. I've learned to love him because he always lifts me up when I'm down. I'm talking about when you begin to remove those fig leaves off your skin and you put on Jesus, life just doesn't seem the same. Things are different. Things don't get to you like they once upon a time did. Kids become manageable, even when they slide in their word. Why? You're able to deal with them, right? Even when they want to bring your car back with scrapes. Even when they come home with those nasty grades, they become a little bit more manageable with his image. Your spouse begins to appreciate the hard work it takes to make a fine dinner after going to work for 12 hours, taking care of the house and the home. Even if they sit down after a dinner and say, you know what, I think 
I think that, 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 that wham downstairs was, was a little bit scorched. You're able to see the love of Jesus in them. That job is a little bit less stressful, although your boss keep putting the files on your desk and your hours are very long, your job becomes a little bit more less stressful. Your finances, well, I can't, I, I can't do nothing about that because everybody can, can be a millionaire. But you, you, you're content with what God has given you. you. You know how to abide and you know how to abase. You know that everybody, you know, everybody can say, I love Jesus. Everybody can say that. And the Bible says to fear God and give glory to him and worship him that made the heaven and the earth. I'm not talking about that lip service. Everyone that breathes can say, hello, my name is Christina Meredith. And Jesus is the captain of my life. Easy. Everybody in here can say that. Very easy. Any one of you, Paul, I'm Paul. And Jesus is the captain of my life. Everybody, just put your name in there. Diane. Diane, that's my name. Mrs. Elliot. And Jesus is the captain of my life. It's very easy to say that, isn't it? In fact, you go around the church long enough, you'll hear it all the time. But remember, Jesus doesn't want that lip service. Even in Christianity, talk is cheap. What Jesus, my Savior, deserves is true worship that comes from the heart. Live like you love Jesus when times are good and when times are bad. Not just when you're looking into a crowd or looking your best. Live like you love Jesus even after the Sabbath hours are over. Love Jesus. Live like it. Because when everybody else is gone, Jesus is always there and he's always watching you when nobody else is. As I begin to close, I want you to look around at the people who are sitting in front and behind you on the side of you. I want you to look around. Look at how much everybody look like one another. Okay? Simply said that, yes, while our eyes see things that sometimes is not understandable, sometimes it is complex and we don't understand them, we look around and we see that every much, pretty much, bleed red. But see, with God, he's a heart searcher. He can look past the arteria. He can look past the clothing. And sometimes when we neglect to love our Savior enough to voluntarily do what he wants us to do, he can begin to remove those fig leaves for us. Some of us are here not by chance. We have a rough time and a rough situation that's currently going on. Sometimes we find ourselves in church when things are not so well. And it's a good thing that you're here because this is the remedy to all situations. We put on these fig leaves and we try to appear to be okay. We try to be perfect, but there is no perfect or perfection in us. It's only Jesus Christ. Somebody here, as I, my, my, my appeal is very, very simple. The fig leaves represents our own works. Some of us are here from school. Some of us are here because our grandparents and parents have practiced with us for so many years and we're here because of that, because of tradition. Some of us are here because we play a vital role in church every week. 
And while we do these things, our everyday lives gets harder and harder. Some of us are jobless, and you wouldn't tell just looking at it. I'm jobless, but can you tell? I'm always happy in the Lord because I don't need a job to finance me. God has all that I need. And when I don't have it, somebody else always have it for me. God always places somebody in, in your path. So when he asks you and he calls his people to come to him, no matter how far you have gone, no matter what you have done last week, and some of us a couple of hours ago, no matter if we found ourselves on Friday night hanging out with the rest of them, and then we end up here in the morning, straggling on the fence. But God, he's not a respective of man. He doesn't care about your current situation. He cares about where your salvation is. He wants you to know that his plans are perfect plans for you. It's real, people. Right now, all heads are bowed and eyes are closed. In your heart, you feel alone. You don't know where to turn. I'll pray for you this morning. If you really don't want to turn your life around, but there's something in a way of your relationship with God, and you want a more closer walk with God, I'm going to pray for you. See, my appeal is not only for those who don't have a, a church home, but it's for those who are in the church that need a new reconnection or re reconstruction of their life. My appeal is simply to come to Jesus. And if you think that your life is okay, is fine, you, 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 you're abounding in him, and, and you know how to abase in him. And you just want to make that commitment today. You want to concentrate yourself. Consecrate yourself at this moment. Stand with me. Stand with me. Because I want to pray that your faith don't change. As every eye is closed and every head is bowed. I'm going to pray for you, God's remnant church. Oh, Father God, you have placed me here in this predicament where I have no power. I have no might. But because you are a God that stretches out your hand and that clothes your people, I can stand here on the solid rock. I can stand here before your people, some older than I, wiser than I. I can stand here for your people, and I can pray. So, Lord, I want to first of all thank you for this opportunity to seek you in your glory, to be used by you. Lord, I come to you with an offering of your people. Those of them who are standing right here want to recommit their lives, their relationship with you. They want to grow stronger in you. They want to take off the fig leaves and put on your image, Lord. We know that you can do it because you said it in your will, in your, will, in your word, that you don't want not one soul to be lost. So I ask by your power and by your might, Lord, you look upon your people as the chosen remnant, saving the best for last, Lord. I ask that you would renew a right spirit and mind in your children. I ask that you will make them priests of their homes, make them loving wives of their home, make them obedient children of their parents. That one day, one day, the practice of being obedient and honoring their parents, they can so much so do it for their earthly father. Now, Lord, I ask these blessings not because 
I'm here, but because you are willing to hear and answer. Thank you, dear Lord, for this is your day and this is your people. And we all say in Jesus' name, amen and amen.